It's been described as a broken system, and for years, efforts to fix it have fallen short. We're trying to put saran wrap over a fire hydrant with a rubber band. It's a huge problem that everybody needs to come together to fix. There are more than 15,000 children in the Texas foster care system, children who have been abused, neglected, and removed from their homes. We have a one and two year old that was placed with us not too long ago. Both of them tested very high for methamphetamines. Sometimes the kids thrust into the state's care are left with nowhere to go and end up sleeping in offices. This is a plea that we need more foster care beds for our most vulnerable, and that's our foster children. It's a topic KSAT took on in a Defenders special in 2017, and years later, many of those same problems persist. The debut of a new way of working with foster kids in Bear County was supposed to be a solution. It's been a growing crisis within San Antonio foster care that appears to be getting worse. Fights, assaults, and more serious sexual offenses involving children. Citing conditions that threaten the safety of children, the head of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services moved forward with plans to have the children's shelter remove all kids from its emergency shelter. Two weeks after submitting an action plan to get into compliance, the local agency that was tasked here to place foster children has now canceled its contract. The community at large wants to do something about the foster system. They care about it, but it is so complex that they don't understand it in its entirety. We don't want to run away from the storm. We want to run through the storm and help and know that it's better on the other side. There's nights when I just lay there thinking, God, show me how to build capacity. Show me what to do for these kids. Those working in the system still hold out hope for solutions from the state, but no, there is no time to wait on that. A fix will take all of us. These kids will leave foster care without any permanent housing, with um, little education or job training because they've been bounced around a lot, and they leave without even one trusted adult in their life. It's hard sometimes to really put into words that anger that you have as a teenager because you want to be normal and you can't be normal. If the community can be patient and give us time to build it, we will make it work. In this episode of KSAT Explains, we're examining how the Texas foster care system is supposed to work, the ways in which it's currently failing, and what each of us can do to help. KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains. KSAT Explains. On demand, in-depth perspective. Perspective on stories we bring you in our newscast throughout the day. We're looking into concerns over voting safety during a pandemic and the battle over mail-in voting. A look at how the protests and demonstrations have played out in our city and an examination of what it means to be black in San Antonio. An issue that you have likely felt the effects of, rising property taxes. The roots of Tejano run deep in South Texas. We examine the cultural impact the music has had in San Antonio. The team is focusing on the state's foster care system how it's supposed to work and the ways in which it failed. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAN Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. The issue of innocent children being abused and neglected, and as a result, their lives upended and uncertain, is one that moves so many of us to want to act. But with a problem so large wrapped up in a system that's so complicated, it's hard to know where to start. Then with the fallout of family tapestry here in San Antonio, the nonprofit created to take over foster care in Bear County, that made things even more complex. We're examining what happened there, even hearing the account of one former employee. Overall, we want you to have a better understanding of how the system works and what's happened in recent years to get us to where we are today, a place that many who work in this field call a crisis point. But first, we want you to hear from those who have lived it people who know firsthand what it's like to be in foster care. When you go to the foster care system, it's all about survival, making sure you don't end up homeless, making sure that you make something out of yourself because even though they don't say it, a lot of people are against you. I wasn't put into the foster care system until I was a teenager. Um, I was 
Within six months, I was moved four times. When you get taken, like any of the friends that you had prior to CPS, you go kind of off the grid because there's a lot of facilities that you can't have a phone, you can't have computer access, like, you know what I'm saying? So after a while, when you're just gone, people kind of just forget about you. When we were first placed with our kids, um, it was really overwhelming because the, the state often hands you this affidavit full of diagnosis that a lot of people have never heard of before. And I found very quickly that the information is limited, um, but the resources were even more scarce. So they'll go through, you know, 20, 25 placements. My own uh, younger foster son has lost count after 30 placements uh, because he was in it from the age of five. There's always these very small subliminal like reminders that you're not in care, right? So like when they have like father-daughter days at like school or daddy-daughter dances or things like that, um, sleepovers, uh, you know, you have to get pre-approved to go to a sleepover. You can't be honest and tell people like, dude, like I'm going through it right now, you know what I mean? And that's why I can't go to the football games and the dances and try out for sports and like movies on the weekends, like stuff that normal kids can do. When you have a mother and a father, you have somebody there telling you, okay, you gotta enroll for college, you gotta do this, you gotta finish school, wake up this time, go to get a job, whatever the case may be. And when you're in foster care, you don't have someone, you have a house parent that's watching over all these kids and a lot of them, it's just a paycheck. So you don't really feel like they have your best interests at heart. We're welcome to the help, but don't ever make it seem like you have pity on us because you know we've overcome a lot of hurdles that would break other people. But what many see as broken is the system itself. It's a reason why the state of Texas has pushed to privatize some aspects of foster care, creating what's called a community-based care model. We'll explain that in a moment. But first, let's break down what happens from the time there's a report of abuse or neglect. It may be an outcry from a uh, teacher or it may be a physician, you know, or it may be even law enforcement. And what they do is, uh, you know, they contact and call the hotline for the Department of Family Protective Services. If the DFPS investigation finds the allegations of abuse or neglect to be credible, the investigator presents their findings to a judge to get a court order for the child to be removed from their home. One of the biggest counties in Texas, Bear County, had the highest removal rate in fiscal year 2020. 20, with more than 1,700 children, or 3.3 kids per every 1,000 children. And in 2020, Bear County had the highest number of kids in care of any county in Texas. As soon as the court order for removal is signed, Child Protective Services takes the child into state custody. At this point, the child is assigned a caseworker and an attorney ad litem. The job of the attorney is to represent the child in court. The caseworker is the point person for everyone involved. Children, parents, family members, teachers, foster parents. They look out for the child's best interests. For years, critics have pointed to overburdened CPS caseworkers as one of the system's flaws. According to state data, the average daily caseload is more than 24 cases per caseworker, notably higher than the recommended number. The Dallas Morning News reports that in 2019, the state of Texas agreed to try to get that number to between 14 and 17 children per conservatorship caseworker. CPS declined our interview request, but when we asked about how the system works, they sent us a statement saying the first effort is to place the child with relatives and keep them out of foster care. If a blood relative is not an option, CPS or a nonprofit may try to find another family-like setting, such as a licensed foster home or a friend or acquaintance. When all of that is not possible, what may happen is that they are, uh, we've put them in a placement, what's called a GRO, it's a general residential operation. General residential operations are group settings that provide round the clock care. Kids in need of extra medical care for mental health or substance abuse issues perhaps may end up at a residential treatment center. Some of the girls that I was in foster homes with are in vastly different um, situations in their life even though we went through a similar thing. Robin Parker used to be in foster care. She worked as the program outreach coordinator with Through Project, a nonprofit dedicated to providing support to foster youth as they age out of the system. Robin aged out when she turned 19. Some went through kinship, kinship placements, so they were with their family. Some went straight into foster homes, some went into group homes, some went into shelters, and so those 
situations are different. At the end of the day, the ultimate goal is to first make sure a child is in a safe situation and, if possible, help parents get their children back. Several programs affiliated with foster care aim to train and educate parents to help them do that. That's ultimately the, the number one goal, to reunify the families with their children. If safely reuniting families is not possible, the next step is to find a permanent home for the child in the hopes of avoiding bouncing them around from place to place. But all too often, that's exactly what happens. We rarely get anyone in here that's been in less than 10. I think um, I, th I think I've met one youth that's had one or two placements. Meet Michelle Cayeros. She's in what's called extended foster care, a program that allows some young adults turning 18 in foster care the chance to continue to stay in care until they turn 21. If they are still in high school, in college or are working at least 80 hours a month. Michelle is a student and mentor at Texas A&M San Antonio. She pointed to all of the placement changes as one of the many reasons the system is broken. Wherever there's a bed open is where you're probably going to go. It's so overcrowded, like sometimes you have to sleep in the CPS office. Michelle remembers the problems that existed at the group home facilities where she was placed. Anything that I ever had that was valuable, any nice clothes, nice shoes, jewelry, or anything that was from my family that like I would never be able to replace, like I always kept locked up in my kitchen caseworker's office. I feel like I've had some low spots in my life, but I don't know. You do what you got to do. Michelle is far from alone when it comes to kids in foster care, recognizing that there are problems. In fact, in 2011, a child advocacy group sued the state on behalf of nine foster care kids in Texas. RJ Marquez explains what that ongoing legal battle is all about and what's changed as a result. That lawsuit in 2011 alleged that the system failed to protect children in foster care from an unreasonable risk of harm. And in 2015, U.S. District Court Judge Janice Graham Jack ruled in favor of the children, saying that the system was unconstitutional. Judge Jack blasted the state for running a system where she wrote, quote, rape, abuse, and instability are the norm, and where children almost uniformly leave state custody more damaged than when they entered. Jack ordered all foster group homes that were operating without 24-hour adult supervision to be shut down. She also ordered that two child welfare experts, known as special masters, work with DFPS to develop a plan to address the issues raised in the case. Kids were supposed to be placed with their siblings. Kids were supposed to be um, found a forever home. All those things uh, were supposed to be you know, normalcy. That was the mandate they were supposed to do for kids who were taken into custody not temporarily, but full custody of the state. A year later in 2016, the appointed special masters released a report with dozens of recommendations to improve the foster care system. But the state objected to those recommendations because state leaders said the 2017 Texas legislature was already taking significant action to improve the system. And during the 2017 legislative session, lawmakers enacted a number of bills focused on improving the lives of children in the state's foster care system. That included authorizing community-based care. In January of 2018, Judge Jack issued another order that included sweeping changes to policies, systems, and staffing. It would have required the state to make nearly 100 changes to the system and the way it cares for children. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton immediately appealed the order, calling it impractical. What followed was a series of back-and-forth lawsuits where ultimately the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals overturned some of Judge Jack's mandates but other requirements were upheld. But there are still questions about whether this type of state oversight is the best way to move forward. It's been nearly a decade-long battle with no clear end in sight. Obviously, everybody's being looked over uh, by a federal court down in South Texas. So there is a, a tremendous amount of scrutiny and pressure on the system, which is causing a lot of placements to close down. We're talking about the most vulnerable children and youth in the state of Texas. We have a federal court overseen now um, with foster care system with standing court orders as a result of the class action lawsuit. The good news is all of the oversight that, that we are experiencing right now, while it may seem like a lot and it may at times seem uh, confusing, there are the same goals, which is around the safety of children. And that is something we are all aligned with. Moving the Texas foster care system to what's known as a community-based model of care, or a CBC, was supposed to be a solution. It was a plan approved by lawmakers to move away from a one-size-fits-all model to a more focused approach. The legislation requires the state to contract with regional nonprofits to care for foster kids.
it's led by the legislator in our state, to privatize foster care across smaller community regions to be able to better serve the needs of kids. The needs in El Paso are different from the needs in Houston and Lubbock and San Antonio. So it's really the, the state's way to fix the foster care system and partner with local community providers. Once a child is removed from their parents' custody, instead of being in the care of the state, they would be in the care of the CBC. The goal of each CBC is to eventually do what CPS does. So eventually, as they process through each phase, they will be doing the legal work with the kids, the adoption, the kinship placements, the placement of the kids, pretty much everything but investigation. Using this model, the nonprofit is tasked with creating a network of local foster placement agencies that work directly with foster families and group facilities to find each child a bed. The move to privatize was controversial. Some worried it would decrease transparency. According to a 2019 Texas Monthly article, the nonprofits taking over the foster care system in each region are largely judged on self reported statistics. The concern there being that many stories of abuse and neglect of children in the system would go unheard. Five regions in Texas have rolled out community based care. The rollout is done in phases, and each region is in a different phase. Region 8A includes the Bear County, San Antonio area. Family Tapestry, a division of the Children's Shelter in San Antonio, was awarded the state contract for this region in 2018. And there was excitement about this new localized approach. Opportunity to contract with other agencies in our area to truly create a unique experience with tailored services for children and families. But in the spring of 2021, the state's deal with family tapestry unraveled, which we'll explain in a moment. Meanwhile, Region 2 in North Texas has made it through its first full year of Stage 2 of its CBC rollout. There are a total of three stages to fully transition to a CBC model. Linda Garcia with To Engage, the nonprofit in charge of Region 2, is responsible for 800 children across 30 counties. She says the CBC model allows them to be more laser focused. We get to focus on our smaller community. Prior to community based care, the state was caring for 17,000 plus children. Only you're concentrating on the 1,600 kids that are in your care. You know at any given time where they are. Uh, what they need in relation to services, and then you also know what the families need. And it's easier to develop those services just for a small population instead of having tried to develop services for the whole state. Garcia does acknowledge that implementing the CBC model has been challenging. There is a, a, a process and a strategy for improving the system. And unfortunately, it just, the system just, you're not able to change it as quickly as, as if you're sitting on the outside that you're, you're not able to see it. And I think um, that's where I see a lot of skepticism from. Some of the challenges include finding the best placement for a child within the required seven hour period. To Engage has also struggled with meeting a specific performance goal set by the state, placing children within a 50 mile radius of their home. If you look at my rural area, the stretches like 250 miles from one direction to another. And if I place a child, if I, we remove a child in Wichita Falls and place them in Abilene, I, you know, it's still in my area, but I'm not meeting my performance goals. Despite the challenges, the state is pushing forward with expansion. St. Jude's Ranch for Children, or SJRC Texas, a nonprofit that has served our area for 37 years, was awarded a CBC contract. They'll be taking over Region 8B, that's 27 counties surrounding Bear County. SJRC's new division will be called Belong. SJRC currently has about 110 kids across their program today in residential and community foster care. With Belong, they'll be in charge of 675 children. This new division, Belong, is just a mission expansion. We're expanding our mission to serve more, to serve others, and to be the child welfare lead in our community. DFPS describes community-based care as a better way to provide services than traditional foster care but some remain skeptical about whether it is truly working. I love the idea of community-based care. I, I still think it, it could work. Um, 
But again, it is a huge machine and community-based care takes the entire community. I think we've all realized that capacity is the biggest struggle. We have got to find more places and safe, loving homes for our kids. Enmeshed in the statewide foster care capacity crisis is the all-out collapse of community-based care here in San Antonio. In May, Family Tapestry terminated its contract with the state, blowing up that agreement more than two years before it was set to expire. Dylan Collier explains that comes weeks after bad publicity for the shelter, which in late April was forced to remove children from its emergency shelter, and then just days later was blasted by a federal judge for running a, quote, dangerous, unsafe operation. A warning, the following story does contain graphic information that may not be suitable for all viewers. These photos were taken this summer just outside Child Protective Services San Antonio headquarters. The kids, under the supervision of a CPS employee, are about to cross a busy street in order to get a meal, and if they're lucky, a shower. They are children without placement, known as CWAP. Mostly teenagers, anywhere from 30 to 60 CWAP have been living and sleeping in CPS offices around San Antonio at any given time recently because right now, they literally have nowhere else to go. You're talking about kids who have grown up in very harsh environments under extreme circumstances, abuse, neglect, who really need help. This former children's shelter employee asked that we conceal his identity. He was among the dozens of staffers assigned to its emergency shelter laid off after the facility was ordered in late April to find placements for all of its kids. The commissioner of the Department of Family and Protective Services informing shelter leadership that the situation was unacceptable and threatened the safety of the children. Among the myriad problems, in 2020, it was alleged that six children, all under the age of 10, engaged in sexual contact under their beds at the shelter, while a staffer was assisting other kids. The ex-employee recalling a second incident more recently of a 12-year-old girl sexually assaulted after she and two teens slipped away from staff. The 17-year-old girl um, and the 15-year-old boy forced the 12-year-old girl to give the boy uh, oral. Even after it was reported to police, the two teens remained at the shelter and were among the last to be placed elsewhere. What was your frustration with management there, Ned Rodriguez, other people that run the shelter and the various facilities. I have never seen that woman at all, period, in my years in my years that I've been there. Children's Shelter President and CEO Annette Rodriguez did not respond to a request for an interview for this story. Why is the leadership of the San Antonio Children's Shelter still employed? I am at a loss. More issues with the shelter and with the state's struggling foster care system as a whole have been brought into the light thanks to, of all things, TikTok. We are in dire straits down here. Abbott, you've got to do something and you've got to do something now. Foster care advocate and foster to adopt parent Shannon Ivey first joined the social media site during the pandemic for her work as a college professor and has now quickly amassed over 57,000 followers and well over half a million likes. Drowning, medical neglect. Over Using unabashed Ivey, language IFR, that gets right to the point. My life is fraught with daily response to legislation, daily response to policy change, because it affects my kids and it affects all the kids that come out here. As an employee, we work full 12, 10 hour shifts. Ivy's account has also become a safe space of sorts for former children's shelter employees to describe their experiences while working there. At the end of the day, people do want to help and they just see this monolith of a problem and they don't know what to do. And while the children's shelter has been a frequent target of critics of the state's attempted move to privatize foster care, it is far from the only problem in San Antonio. As Rodriguez pointed out in this letter to the state in late April, Texas has lost a thousand foster care beds due to voluntary and involuntary closures of placement facilities. Nearly half of those beds in Bear County alone residential treatment centers, or RTCs, which often provide care to the most challenging youth, have been closing here at an alarming rate. They have high needs and high levels of uh, supervision. And so basically we have a lot of placements that are saying, we can't do this anymore. Kids were getting hurt, 
Um, you know, nobody was taking any any type of blame for that. It was just, you know, oh, they just fight. Oh, they just, you know, they hurt each other. And staff was hurting kids because they weren't trained properly. So there are some that I truly believe somebody should have stepped in probably a long time ago and said, enough's enough. And while RTCs have racked up their fair share of troubling abuse and neglect incidents, according to federal court reports, some foster care advocates also blame the closure of residential treatment centers on new rules and requirements put in place as a result of that 2011 lawsuit. More requirements for staff and training, yet not enough funding offered to make it possible leaving those children who need the most specialized care with nowhere to turn. You have these kids who are struggling from things that happened to them, not things they chose to do. You know, these are kids struggling because things happened to them and then we, are, we expect them to just fix it. And they didn't create the problem to begin with. The issue of children without placement was addressed by the Texas legislature this year. Governor Greg Abbott signed a law that, among other things, prohibits kids from sleeping in CPS offices. But that mandate does not spell out where children who have no place to go should be taken instead. Since the beginning of this year, the number of children without placement has consistently increased month after month. In June, the state reports there were 415 children without a traditional foster care placement for at least two nights. So with family tapestry out, what does that mean for foster care in Bear County? DFPS is now back in charge and has taken over the services that family tapestry was providing. Those we talked to and the state say there will be no disruption to children, families or foster care providers. But the end of the state's contract with family tapestry certainly did not mean an end to children being abused or neglected and ultimately removed from their homes. All the while, advocates and foster care agencies have been working to try to find placements for these kids, not knowing what will come next with the system. We talked to some of those people to find out the challenges they face day in and day out, outside of any red tape or bureaucratic bickering. They tell us what they think solutions look like and what you can do to help. I've never been more fearful for kids' lives as I am right now in the state of Texas. It's, it's bad and nobody has a plan and everybody's just scrambling. But in 2015, Sandra Adjason had her own plan. After working as a CPS investigator for three years, she felt foster children had no voice. So she started True Light 127 Ministries in her own garage. That's one to shine truth and light into their lives one way or the other find a way to do it. And in the years since, her foster agency has grown bigger than she ever expected. So big, it became a village. So how many homes do you have? We have four houses. Four houses. Yes, okay. we're doing a, we're hoping to get a fifth house. We've been doing some fundraising. Four houses at the True Light Youth Village that are home to 35 foster children. Each house with adult staff 24 seven, at least one adult awake. 24 seven. That's one of the new requirements as a result of that 2011 lawsuit. Sadly, a lot of them end up staying here for several months. I mean, we're great, but we're not a foster home, but most of them don't have a foster home to go to due to their age. Sometimes the race and sometimes that there's more than a couple of kids in the group. And so they end up staying here long term. This is our pantry. This is delivery day. So it's a little bit of a disaster. Each house here gets to create their own menu. So we don't have, I know we could save money on groceries if we did a blanketed menu, um, but I feel like kids lose so much that the least I can give them is a meal that reminds them of home. Just a few miles down the road, also in Seguin. We start with Claudine and Olive. Sits Ivy Family Farms. She doesn't really like carrots, she likes chips. You met Shannon Ivy earlier, an adoptive mom and outspoken advocate for foster kids whose message has taken off on TikTok. But here. I want to show you this one because this is like super cool. This is one of my favorite parts. Things are simpler. For about a year, Shannon Ivy and her family have been hosting foster kids on their farm on weekends, providing an escape from their therapies, uncertainties and frustrations. Kids do exactly what you did, which is all these like weird chickens and things are running at you and they just and that ridiculousness and they just start laughing. And so it, it, invariably kids get disarmed almost immediately and they start laughing and they just 
our whole goal when they come out here is for them just to be kids because they have been through the institution um, over and over and over again. They've had all of these adults sitting there saying, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to follow this rule. And here we just don't want that. <laughs> we just want them to be silly. Shannon and her husband, Steve, got the idea to start a care farm after seeing the difference it made for their own kids who have multiple diagnoses. We would go out to my dad's farm and I would be a mess because I would, I don't know what to do. I'm not doing it right, you know? And my dad looked at Steven and I and said, you know, sometimes Shannon, kids just need to dig a hole in the dirt. <laughs> and I was like, oh, they need therapy and all of these other things, which they do. But he was right, because after my kids would go out to his 10 acre farm in Stockdale, they were better for a week and they were more calm. They slept better. The, the marked improvement was a lack of night terrors. Um, their food consumption would be more normalized. Here on their own farm, kids can feed the animals, gather eggs, plant, growing something for the future. We generally put them on the back of the tractor and we come out here and we talk about vision because a lot of the kids get stuck in the moment that they're in right now and they think that that's all that it's ever going to be. Two women working to improve the lives of foster children in their own ways. Their thoughts on solutions share some common ground. For the adults to listen. That's the truth because right now no one is listening to one another. It's even worse for the kids. The kids are telling the adults in these situations, I need A, B, or C. I can't do A, B, or C, and no one is listening to them. We're the grown-ups. Like, we have to get it together. We have to learn to communicate with each other. The state contracting department has to learn to communicate with the licensing the department. The licensing department needs to communicate with the agencies better. The contracting needs to communicate with agencies better. There's so many grown-ups involved in this, and we're the ones that's running around with like a chicken with their head cut off. While communication seems lacking, so is funding, especially for the children who need that most intense level of care in residential treatment centers. When they end up 18, doing things in society that's harmful to others or they're living under the bridge or they're drug addicts themselves and then their kids up in the C CPS system, we are helping them to fail. You cannot tell us to take care of kids and then not pay us child support. That's kind of just the way it is. But state funding often gets tied up in politics. One more reason why it's critical to make solutions personal and we can all do our part. I think the first thing that you have to ask yourself are what is my time and talent? So where do, where can I fit into this? Like, what can I reasonably do? Do I have $10 extra a month that I'm going to, like in the church world, tithe to these organizations? Do I have time to devote to an organization? Do I have a skill? like I'm a lawyer and so I can pro bono. Some people can say, here's a million dollars, you know, go out there and start an RTC, Sandra. Okay. <laughs> you know, some people can say, I don't have a million dollars, but I can tutor for an hour. And they don't think that's a lot, but we have a volunteer that comes out here to the village every week and she's done it for two years now for one day a week. She comes out here and she loves on these kids. And she's sad when they go home because she misses them and she's overjoyed when she gets to meet the new ones and they feel every bit of that and they know somebody cares. We need people just to um, look at what they can give and, and know that that's enough. The future of community-based care in Bear County is uncertain. We reached out to the state to find out about any potential plans, and they told us it was too early to say, and that the state's Office of Community-Based Care is now being implemented. We hope we've given you a better overall understanding of the foster care system and where we are today. We'll keep watching to see what happens going forward. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. We'll see you next time.